Rob, it's delightful to be here today. Um, you're the chief exec of Trunkey. Um, I have your book here, which is very exciting, and I'd recommend it to everyone. Uh, we're at the mothership of Trunkey, and obviously you've got the whole array of, of products here. You've been on this amazing journey, uh, a journey of resilience, a journey of keeping going when it gets incredibly tough. You've been in front of the dragons. You've uh, been awarded with an MBE. Uh, Rob, it's, we're going to unpack this journey and, uh, and find out more about you and, and where you've had this amazing experience. So thank you for uh, taking the time to be with me today, Rob. Great. I'm um, happy to share it. Brilliant. So Rob, uh, I think you and I both know we've had a shared experience of being in Newcastle. You know, well, I was at Newcastle Uni in Europe and Newcastle with your product design course. How did you actually end up in Newcastle all those years ago? What actually brought you there and how did this whole journey begin? Well, I guess it starts, um, the pinnacle moment was when I was about 14. Uh, and that was when I made this career choice to become a product designer. But predating that, I was struggling in school with dyslexia. Uh, I've always been very creative. Uh, I love using my hands. I love watching my dad build things. He was a uh, retail interior designer, but an incredibly talented carpenter. And um, at school, high school, there was just graphics and what, CDT, craft design and technology. So I, I enjoyed those subjects, but really started thinking what uh, professions there were out there for designers and uh, stumbled across product design. And uh, within the, this one more middle-aged product design community, there's a famous book by Richard Seymour and Dick Powell, which was... Uh, about marker rendering and how to create these amazing looking products uh, of consu mainly consumer goods. And that just caught my uh, real attention. And I thought that's what I want to do, I want to design the future. Um, so from 14, it was then planning out how, how I needed to get to university. And at the time, the best course in the country was up, up at Northumbria, where now famous Jonathan Ives of Apple fame studied as well. Did you ever get to meet Johnny or was he always separate? I, I met him once, not, not at university, but when he was giving a talk many years ago. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was just a, a brief chat. Brilliant. And uh, you're at Northumbria University. So where did Trunky come from? Did that just appear one day when you were on the course or what was the story there? It was the second year. It was a four-year course, sandwich course with uh, work placements. And uh, in the second year, we were asked to enter a national luggage design competition that was run for students across the country, uh, sponsored by a big plastics manufacturer, BASF. Uh, and kind of looking for inspiration, I went down to Phoenix and Eldon Square, looking at the, the luggage section's department store, and kind of remember hard molded suitcases were quite fashionable um, using this new plastic technology in luggage, but it was all black and boring. and. Uh, and I eventually drifted off into the kids' toy section and was there, kind of almost stood in front of these ride-on toys, reminiscing about my younger brother, relentlessly riding his tractor around the garden as a, as a child. And I just thought, well, actually, kids get bored traveling. Uh, ride-on toys use a manufacturing technique that wastes load space. And mm -hmm. um, this adult technology that's on fashion at the moment is injection molded suitcases. Why not marry the two together and, and create a ride-on suitcase? So that was the eureka moment. Um, and I went on to win the competition in 98. Mm. And my first adventure into business was really from the judges who said, you know, what, you've got quite a commercial idea here. You should try and license it. So I thought, oh, yeah, this is great. I'll, uh, I'll approach Carlton, um, back then the UK's largest luggage manufacturer, and pitch Trunky to them, told them we're going to revolutionise family travel together. And they very politely told me they're in the business of making luggage and I invented a toy. Mm. So uh, under turn, I thought well, that gives me another option. I can chase down toy companies and uh, eventually toy companies were telling me I'd invented a piece of luggage and not a toy. So it was, a, it was a very unique product that didn't really fit in either market. So that was quite a struggle to, to try and find to get it off the ground again. So to pick up the timeline, uh, had this happened while you were at university or was this coming at the back end of university? So I started approaching manufacturers during university. Um, and uh, carried on afterwards. But my, f my first job out, out of university was over in Taiwan working for a, a company called the Chinese Productivity Center. Uh, and I was kind of like a, a design slave chucking out all sorts of designs for consumer products, which was great to have these briefs, but all these companies had heavily subsidized design consultancy from the government. So they kept asking for more and more and I never got any direction of, well, here's a, a 
uh, an idea for a range of hands-free kits. What do you think? And it's like, oh, we'd like to see some more rather than, oh, we like that grey one, or we like the, the use of steel on that one, or it's got no direction. So it's, it's a bit like a headless design chicken. And did you work in consultancy for a while in Taiwan? Did that take you anywhere else? After that, I uh, travelled Australia, tried to find a full-time job as a product designer, but um, couldn't find any. So I ended up from the age of 14 to sort of early 20s, realising I'm going to have to find something else I can do to pay the bills and ended up doing uh, door-to-door sales of Chubb security systems and, and working in a call centre trying to sell cheap telephone lines. But that was a great lesson on, on selling uh, and learned some good sales techniques, although I was a, a useless salesperson. And you did a stint <coughs> in the US as well, is that right? Yeah, I was, um, uh, had an amazing time when I was 19 um, doing an internship in New York. That was just incredible. One thing that blew me away in the book, it was actually reminding me about many of my friends in sales, that whole ability to create opportunities and uh, how you'd often approach new businesses. Do, could you share with, with me about how that journey goes in terms of the re, the relentless nature of, of finding new opportunity? Yeah, like I think the, the thing I realised when I was in Australia doing these jobs is I'm great at selling something if I'm passionate about it and I really struggle to find passion with cheap phone lines and job security systems uh but selling myself as a product designer you know i'll do that till the, till the cows come home so uh when i got back to the uk struggling to find full-time work so it was the end of the last recession in 2002 uh but i'd phone up all the leading consultancies say oh, I'm, I'm in town next week uh, i'm an award-winning designer that's been working in taiwan and new york uh would you have five minutes just to have a quick chat and um, I wasn't around the corner that, that day. I was back in my parents' house up in Chester. But if they said yes, I'd be on the train getting down there and, and pimping my wares. I think you'd be amazed to know how many of my clients have the same approach to business. <laughs> There's not often not an opportunity around the corner. It's very much been uh, calculatedly created. But yeah. yeah. Um, so you've done the consultancy. And one thing I find, Rob, I've met and interviewed many engineers over the years, and many have good ideas. but. There's a difference between having an idea and actually commercializing an idea. How did you actually take it from when those judges were saying that's a cracking idea, you can license it right through to having the horsepower from your side to drive it through and actually get the first opportunity? What was that journey like? Well, the, the first opportunity happened through, I was still keen to license the idea because I wanted to carry on working in design consultancies. Uh, learning on the job and getting lots of varied experience in different product categories. So I was still keen to license it. Um, I ended up uh, coming back from Australia. Um, couldn't really find any um, full-time work, as I said. Freelancing for some consultancies, but ended up really wanting to spend some time getting Trunky off the ground again. Ended up in the job centre um, and uh, got put on a few starting your own business workshops, but that, that really didn't touch the sides. Uh, it was the Prince's Trust that I reached out to that really were very instrumental in those early days, giving me some great mentoring and a bit of um, a bit of cash to um, get the business off the ground. And um, with that, I ended up securing a licensing deal with a toy company in 2003 who were, loved the idea. Uh, we quickly signed a global licensing deal. I spent nearly my entire £4,000 on the Prince's Trust on legal fees, drawing up a a technology transfer agreement and they had global rights to make me a millionaire. Uh, fast forward three years, they uh, made me ten thousand, I think nine thousand um, dollars and they had failed miserably to get the product uh, to market. They only had one customer in Saudi Arabia, never, Trunk had never been to the UK, to Europe or even the US. Uh, and I was working as a design consultant in Bristol for a really good consultancy. My, one of my biggest clients was Unilever, working with the brand managers there and learning a lot about the power of good branding. And when I picked up the phone to the, the licensee set, who told me um, they'd run out of cash, we're going to have to go into liquidation, it quickly occurred to me that um, I quite fancy having to go at this myself. Clearly, Trunky isn't a toy and it's not luggage. It should be a lifestyle brand pitched to parents and kids. Uh, and with that in mind, I quit my job and started Trunky on the 5th of May 2006. So do you look back fondly on that actually happening? I mean, some would say, gosh, that was a, it could have been a bit of a disaster and missed opportunity, but was that actually a real blessing in disguise for you? I think a lot of opportunities come out of your frustrations, uh, whether that's frustrations with a product or a service or an experience, and then you 
you, you're forced to think differently about it. And, and my frustrations with this licensing company, with this, sorry, the toy company, uh, have never got the product anywhere. Um, I just felt like I was now in the right time, the right place to have a go myself. And did it pick up at the rate that you'd expected? You know, it's easy when many people start a business, they assume it's a nice linear increase of everything. What was yeah. the journey like in the early days of Chunky? Yeah, it was, it was interesting. In fact, in writing the book, I dusted off some old files and looked at my old forecast for the first three years and uh, actually got to year three and year two. So that's not too bad going, but they were pretty aggressive numbers. Uh, and the split of sales as well was quite interesting what I was thinking back then. But um, yeah. Uh, it's, um, I guess at the time I was just driven by wanting to get my products on the shop shelf. Um, it wasn't so much about achieving those numbers. I'm not that financially driven. It's just about getting your product out there. Um, and then the, the, the product ended up getting out there through international sales. First of all, with the Museum of Modern Art in New York buying Trunky, that's my first customer, getting interest from Japan and Australia, becoming signing up distribution uh, deals over there before I really got a foot in the door at the high street because the high street was still saying go and see the luggage buyer go and see the toy buyer go and see the apparel buyer no one wanted to take the product on uh, and my first big break into retail was after Dragon's Den had aired I finally got my uh, foot in the door with John Lewis in the luggage department and um, pitch trunky and they loved the idea uh, I think at the time they were just going to do a trial, but someone must have made an administrative mistake and we rolled out into all their stores and we right. could not keep up with demand for the next three years. I say we, it was me at the time, it was me on my own. But That's an unbelievable story. Um, just while we've got there with Dragon's Den, I think everyone remembers that event fondly with Theo Pafitas really trying to rip off the, the buckle off your um, and strap off your trunky, but... Uh, could you give us an insight into how that experience went, Rob? Because that was quite painful to watch if you were, um, <laughs> but probably even more painful for you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, that story kind of started with um, my Princess Trust mentor actually emailing me, who I was still in contact with, uh, saying, I've just met the researchers for BBC Dragon's Den. Only two seasons had aired, but I was an avid fan and really liked it. Uh, and thought, yeah, that sounds great. I need, uh, I need money, I need mentoring, and I need um, uh, marketing exposure. Certainly got one of those things. Uh, so I emailed the researchers, Dragon's Ride on Trunky was the subject, uh, and they were already halfway through filming season three, so they rushed me through screen tests and everything, and I ended up getting on and, and pitching Trunky. This was two weeks after my first stock had arrived in the UK, so I still didn't have a huge amount to shout about, but I had engineered, manufactured, and bought a product to market. Um, and yeah, went up the stairs, thought, there's no way one of these dragons isn't going to want to invest. And Richard Farley, the Aussie guy with the big floppy hair, he was my target because he had some toddlers. Uh, and I joked with him that he still needed to use Trunky, you know, travels by private jet. Uh, and it stopped, the pitch went perfectly. At one point, the Trunky ended up at Theo's feet and he realized that if you tug the strap really hard, the clip that, held, that holds the strap on bends and he just yanked it as hard as he could, it popped and everything kind of unfolded into pure car crash telly it's uh it's, it was really funny to watch that because you know from a viewer you were looking at it thinking that is a really good product and i guess as a past design guy i'm looking at what theo's doing thinking that's a bit mean because they are things that can be corrected quite yeah. easily without giving the product such a hard time but even your experience what on earth were you feeling in your heart when i mean you'd been on quite a journey to get to that mm -hmm. point was it just thoroughly deflating being in front of the it was, it was frustrating that they just i mean the, the big pitch for me was i've got a brand not just a product but it's a brand and they joked so what we've got donkey pointing to duncan uh, so they didn't get the brand Rick, um, peter jones was lambasting me about how quickly he could copy me he said he could get a, a same product made in china in the market within three months which was complete nonsense and I was just, what am I talking to these guys about? They don't seem to get it. So I'm just wasting my time here. So I did, yeah, I, I left more downhearted because it was going to be on the telly rather than the treatment I got from the, the dragons. Um, and, How did you feel walking down those steps? Well, I felt, felt pretty numb. And then when my senses came to and realized that this is going to be on national telly and I'm going to get pulled to pieces, that, that was quite worrying. But I just thought, well, look, that's going to happen in the future. I can't influence that now. I just got to carry on with the business and, 
and keep doing what I was doing before. And you went home that evening. Did you think Trunky's going to bounce back from this or do you think actually this is pretty horrendous? Um, I, I just spent a few hours thinking this, this isn't looking good, but then it's can't control it, can't do much about it, put it in the back focus on the future and that's the thing that always fascinates me about you rob you every time you know whether it's coming out of university with an idea trying to get it to market getting knocked back from the dragons but then right you're back on your horse again what did you do after that after you know collecting yourself after a bit of time well i had a a, a slightly bigger challenge to get through and that was a couple of weeks before the peak of the summer travel season this was pretty much nine years of my idea now had stock now had a peak summer sales season coming up and uh, it was the height of the terrorist threats i think the german world cup was on and i kind of got home from checking all my inventory in the warehouse sat down on the sofa turned the telly on nine o'clock news the journalist was telling us that uh, the liquid bomb threat had been foiled and there was a big plan to blow up planes in the sky but as a result the government's banned hand luggage what what did he just say <laughs> And the government banned hand luggage, a very product I invented, was banned from its primary use. Um, so that, that required a, a bit of, uh, a bit of creative thinking to try and overcome. Um, but again, for many people, they may think, gosh, my whole idea has just gone out the window. That is predominantly whole luggage where, yeah. you know, it's, uh, what, what were you thinking when, when that was happening? Uh, well, I, I tried to talk to the airlines and to the government and uh, the Department for Travel and Trade and stuff, but I mean, that was just pointless, really, because no one was really going to change their mind based on my uh, opinions. Um, so I quickly learned just to control what I could control, and that was, well, uh, Trunky, all my marketing materials about air travel. So let's talk about staycations. Let's talk about um, using Trunky in this country. Uh, and also, uh, I had complete control over my overhead, so it shut as much as I could down uh, all the outgoings and just try and ride the storm. Uh, and the storm only lasted sort of six weeks. I mean, when it first started, you got no idea how long this is going to go on for, but it was batten down hat hatches and, and just ride through it. Fortunately, I was exporting at the time and actually had a couple of international orders that still went ahead because it only really affected the UK and the US. So uh, there it was really about not where the green shoots are and, uh, and just chase those down. And for those uh, that may be listening to this who've never actually built a distribution network, how hard is that to actually physically engage with the market and get your product out? I appreciate it's changed with the world of e-commerce, but what was it like then? Well, back then the, the main game was FOB China. So it's made in the factory, but you're selling full container loads to large customers or distributors around the world. So you never get to see the goods. Um, and it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's actually quite a nice, smooth way of doing things. So you go to trade shows, you employ sales agents, whatever it is to get those deals and it's container loads going out of the factory, FOB. Um, and you get paid for that. You make a, a smaller margin than you would if you're selling to a, a landed good in the UK. Uh, but it's volume and it, and it works quite nicely. So that, that cash generation was really useful for the business in the early days. Uh, more recently now, retailers just won't commit to large holdings of inventory and push that up to you. Uh, so the, the three sales channels I started off with were the, was the FOB export business and then the UK wholesale business, which was bringing in containers, holding that in inventory and selling it to the likes of John Lewis. And then my e-commerce business, which was a very fledgling. Back then, 14 years ago, you had to get a custom coded e-commerce platform site. Uh, you couldn't just get Shopify off the shelf. So it was trading that as well. Um, so yeah, that was that was the kind of how, how we started off. And, and today we still do that, but the, the splits change quite significantly. It's a huge focus on e-commerce now uh, and our distributors and our retailers. And just to go back in time, when, when all this was going on, how big was your team when it, you know, when it was starting to really get off the ground and you got into China? So manufacturing was in China as well at this point? Yeah, manufacturing was in China back then. Uh, I mean, it was me to start with, and six months in, I, I hired a guy to help out. He, his title was sales and marketing manager, but actually all he ended up doing was operational stuff because in startup, there's so much time spent on ops. Uh, um, uh, so yeah, then then it was building the team up, and I, I kind of learned quite early on that business was all about people, and I'd worked in an industry where you just work hard every day, you're really passionate about what you do and you'll eat pizza in the office every night. Um, 
And then when a couple of my first employees were knocking off at 5.30, I was thinking, where are you going? I'm getting pizza in. And I had to really understand how most people think uh, and they're not as driven as me uh, and how am I going to inspire and lead them. Um, so that was, a, that was a, an interesting journey to go on. It, it became quite simple. You just got to have a really clear purpose, find people who share that purpose. For us, it's not making plastic luggage. It's making products that allow parents and carers to take their kids off exploring the world and now every day with uh, our wider range too. Uh, and then finding uh, passionate people, not necessarily the most experienced, I certainly couldn't afford experienced people at the time, but actually you can train people up, but you can never teach passion. So yeah, it was building a, a team like that that got us to, to a good good place. And then, then it was time to upskill the team and we had to go on our next journey of getting some more experience in, but always looking for those passionate people. And often when I meet, uh, you know, entrepreneurs where they're starting off a business, I mean, you'd come from a product design background. Did you quickly feel as though you were lacking skills from business in certain areas when you were, when the business was growing at such a rate? Yeah, but I mean, business is just about problem solving and I'm a natural problem solver. That's what product design essentially is. So it was just solving problems. Yeah, lots of people are asking what we should be doing. And it's like, I don't know, I've not done this before, but let's think about it <laughs> and, and seek out advice and help in areas where, where you don't know stuff. So yeah, very steep learning curve. And, and actually I joined a, a local CEO group, support group. Um, and I remember on my first day with them, I was sort of stood up, told them who I was. I said, why well, I wanted to join the group. And I'm, I said, I'm tired of winging it and I want to want to learn how to do it properly. And they all laughed and said, we're still winging it today. So that was really reassuring. And, and then, yeah, it's just using common sense. It's, uh, it's so true. I think the number of execs I interview who like to give the impression of knowing it all, but are often hiding behind various <laughs> things where they're slightly weaker. And going back to your uh, chap from the Prince's Trust, has he been a regular mentor in, in the journey of Trunky as you've expanded or has that changed and you've needed to... No, it was only in the very early days that I was, I was engaged with, uh, with him uh, and we occasionally keep in contact now. But um, yeah, we... Uh, it, it, is trying to find people with experience then in retail sales and baby products. But actually in the industry, I mean, the luggage industry doesn't really exist in this country. There's a baby product industry, the toy industry, and, and being in those, talking to fellow exhibitors at trade shows and, and building up a network through that, we all kind of share our war stories and possibly good partners to work with in different countries. And yeah, it's just quite a nice, open and engaging community to, to learn from and and, you know, even when you get stuck now, do you feel as though you can reach out to a network of other other friends or other, you know, entrepreneurs who can, you know, close the gaps or anything that you need to know, Rob? Or? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, there's a couple of little groups of, of CEOs that um, we meet and chat. Uh, I've always um, uh, had a business coach as well, that stroke personal coach. So, yeah, that's, that, I think that was a really valuable tool, not just to help solve a lot of those people issues in the early days, but also to try try and remind me what I'm doing it all for. Uh, and I've been going 100 miles an hour at building this business without any real thought to why am I doing this, other than I just want my product out there. And that, that uh, really gave me a clear uh, vision of what I wanted to create personally for myself, which was a family. I think one of the things I was really struck with with your book, Rob, was uh, was how, how you did open your personal life, you know, and how that linked in with business. Even the 65 roses, where does that come from and, and why is that relevant to your journey? Well, uh, the 65 roses is, is quite often what children refer to the, uh, inherit, the, the genetically inherited disease cystic fibrosis. And that's the disease I was born with along with my twin sister. Um, and I do a lot of business speaking, giving keynotes and, and management um, training on innovation and marketing and stuff and tell my story about resilience. And everyone always says, oh, you should write a book about this. And you know, I, I never really had the time to think much about it. But then um, I, I've had a lot more time recently, uh, spending more time with my family. And um, I thought maybe now's the time to start thinking about a book. But actually, if I tell my personal story, which I never really talk about at all, it may have a wider appeal and may help give people more more um, uh, tips to be more resilient and to try and um, try and encourage people to not fall over when the world falls apart, but um, but to try and pick yourself up and, and move forward.
I think, you know, certainly over the last year, resilience has been such a key word. But even the fact that, Rob, you've been so open about the challenges in your personal life. I meet many people who they'll have problems in business life, but they won't often link that to why things are happening in personal life. So, it's, you know, from a reader, it's really encouraging to see that, you know, you have been so sharing of, of what is driving you. But Well, a common question I get at an event when I'm speaking in the Q&A is what drives you? It actually was... The, the death of my twin sister when we were 16. So that life, life-changing life event really made me realise I've got to make the most out of my life and um, that's my kind of driving force. And and, you, and even now, that that's just continually driving on, Rob, you know, with, with the whole journey even to this day? Yeah, it, it, it's certainly there uh, in my DNA uh, and now it's more about the kids that I've got. So I've, I've actually don't work full-time in the business anymore. I wanted to spend be around as a father so I, I now work three days a week in the business which gave me time to explore the book explore other opportunities and uh, spend some great time with the kids which i i can still say now despite having spent an awful lot of time with them in lockdown uh it's still it's just great i mean they're six four and one so they're still really young and just loads of fun I did an exec interview recently where uh, the, the interviewer was saying if, if you hadn't put your kids up for adoption by the end of the lockdown, you've probably done quite well. <laughs> but uh, it's uh, it, it has been an interesting time. Do you feel like you're getting greater headspace and greater clarity of thought with not working five days a week? Uh, that's a good question, yeah. Um, I, I think you see the bigger picture a lot more rather than all the, the small detail. Um uh, and, and it's allowed me to really focus on the areas where I have the most value, which is around marketing and product development. I'm really interested in commercial strategy and, and e-commerce, so really helping guide the business through to, to the new digital strategies we're implementing. So yeah, it gives you more, definitely gives you more headspace, and uh, you'd be you'd be a lot more creative with your thinking. And do you feel quite supported from home life? Are your kids and your wife behind the business? Do they embrace the hard work and the long hours that it takes to get behind the journey? Uh, well, the, the kids haven't really seen those long hours because uh, I, I kind of started shifting from when, when my first was born into more, more time at home. Uh, but my partner was actually, uh, she joined the business for a short while and ran uh, HR and customer services. So yeah, she knew, knew the business pretty well back then. It hasn't always been easy, Rob. Uh, I've read in the news about the times where you've had people copying your products and those experiences, what actually happened for real from your side in terms of people trying to go after other variants of Trunky, which aren't clearly your product? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I guess the first one was about three years into trading and our Spanish distributor sent me some photos of this really odd looking suitcase uh, which had horns on and wheels but it was grey and um, had a zip so it structurally wasn't strong enough for a child to sit on and clearly someone in China had seen a trunky but not actually got what it was and just created a piece of luggage that looked like it but couldn't function as a ride-on toy so that was quite funny but then the floodgates opened and we've had over 50 lookalike copies now of the trunky um, but you hardly see any of them because they all just copy the concept of a ride-on suitcase, but no one can copy the brand. So they just come and go. Uh, Were you able really to protect traction. any of it in the early days with uh, with IP? So the, the brand's obviously protected. That's heavily protected. Uh, but from a product point of view, you can't really patent the concept of a ride-on suitcase. You can patent how the wheels attach or the catches. In fact, we have some very clever catches. They have a patent, but they don't stop anyone creating a ride-on suitcase. Um, so realizing I couldn't really get a patent for the product in the early days was actually really good because I could spend the, all the available cash I had, which wasn't much, on marketing rather than on legal fees um, getting protection. Uh, but I knew it was a bit of a game uh, and I, I would get copied. So I, I also protected the shape of the product using what's called a European design registration. Um, and in the early days, all the copies looked exactly like a trunky because no one had ever thought of this before and no one could think, uh, certainly the, the people who were copying us couldn't think of a, a better version. So that was really easy to get those stamped out of the market um, using this design registration. And then they kind of started morphing and I liken it to kind of trunkies inbreeding around Schnovel. Uh, so these weird looking contraptions started coming out that, were, that looked a bit like a trunky but looked really ugly. Um, so that was funny 
too, but it was a bit like whack-a-mole. We started in the early days, it was going to these trade shows, certainly out in China, walking trade shows, getting local lawyers involved, uh, walking shows with them and getting these copies taken down. But then it moved more online and it was trying to find all the stuff on Alibaba, Taobao, Timor. Um, but it's moved digital now, so it's all outsourced to what's called an online brand protection agency and their software and algorithms spot the copies and get them taken down. But for a while, I was just on this, this system on Alibaba, just spotting these guys, trying to get them taken down, then to pop back up again and try and get them taken down again. It was just like whack-a-mole. It, it must have been pretty crushing, though, the first time you actually did see a, a copy. How did that feel when, when you, even if it was a NAF copy? Yeah, it was... It's, it, it was more about if someone was going to buy this thinking it was a trunky, that was my real anger um, because it was everyone else has much inferior products because we put we're on our mark five, so we've iterated five times to to deal with all the customer needs and stuff. So these are, are poor quality products that just don't do what they should do. And if someone buys this thinking it's a trunky, then that's brand damage. So that was the, the main uh, frustrations I had. Um, and then the story in the book is around our our big legal battle that took three years, cost a million quid, and went all the way to the Supreme Court, highest court in the land, couldn't have taken it any further because we asked them to defer it to Europe, but they refused, uh, and I lost. And this was on a product that looked incredibly similar, although it was very slightly different to a trunky. Uh, and that was um, that was very uh, frustrating and deeply um, demotivating for a period of time. But again, it was like, I've lost, I've hit the end of the road, there's nothing more I can do. So I've just got to put it behind me and focus on the future. And we were manufacturing in the UK, so we had that to shout about. Um, and this product was really poor quality. Um, they had done a big deal with Tesco's, who find you an awful lot for return products. They must have had so many returns. Anyway, you can't see this product in the market. The year after the Supreme Court, the product wasn't in the market anymore. And it wasn't because um, we'd won, we'd lost. But they just had a really bad product. It was a commercial flop. But you wanted to start with before it was. Oh yeah, so we so we discovered that I discovered this product in Nuremberg Toy Fair in two thousand and thirteen. My sales director came and said, "I've just seen a trunky on another booth." So we went and had a look. Um, got in contact with my lawyers. who got in contact with some German lawyers, and we got a letter uh, written up overnight. Presented it to them the following day. Please take your product down. It's infringing our design reg, uh, and they did. And then. A few weeks later, it was the Spring Fair at the NEC in um, Birmingham, and my sales director was there and said, I've seen those guys, those, I'll use the word, but I've seen those guys again, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, sent them another letter, and this time they refused, and my lawyers were saying, these are, these are uh, constant um, rip-off merchants, they're always ripping things off, so if you want to uh, send them a sled, you're going to have to be prepared to back it up and take it the whole way. So we did, we got a European injunction on them, we took it all the way to the High Court, and we won in the High Court, which was brilliant. And I thought that was it, game over. But they appealed on a technicality, which is a ridiculous technicality. I mean, my line drawing, my, my drawings were CAD renderings, which were in grayscale. And they thought uh, that that should have been interpreted differently to line drawings. Um, nonsense. Uh, and they overturned it on a technicality. And then um, they won an appeal. We thought that was deeply unjust. Ran a big PR campaign with celebrity designers like Sir Terence Conran and Kevin MacLeod to sort of champion British design rights and how this was really muddying the water. And we got our day in the Supreme Court. We actually had the Intellectual Property Office stand up on our side, tell the Supreme Court judges that the ramifications of their decision were so great it should be deferred to Europe. But this was a couple of years before Brexit, so it might have, in hindsight, been uh, red, red wool to. Symbols. Yeah, yeah, indeed. And, and have we seen any other negative things happening as a result of, of that action? That you know, has it has anything else impacted other designers or that you know of so far? Yeah, um, uh, it, it has had a, a detrimental impact into the understanding of what your design rights are and how they can be defended. Yeah, sadly. That's not good for UK design and manufacturer by any means. Um, but again, with this story, Rob, I have a feeling that you won't have been beaten down and just rolled over and said, that's it. Um, I can't think what it must be like getting a massive legal bill for uh, um, to pay someone that you don't even like. Um, but uh, I assume you bounced back. Where was the good that came out of the, the case of taking it right the way to the High Court? 
Well, the um, the whole time I was very keen to to talk about this openly, uh, and actually the press really picked up on it because brands don't tend to talk about being copied. It's a bit like your dirty laundry. Uh, so we got loads of column inches following the whole story all the way through for three years. And the day we we uh, uh, heard that we had lost and it was publicly made available, we ran a story in every single national newspaper with a full colour picture of our product from our stock photography, not um, their product. Um, so we got a huge amount of marketing exposure on the back of it. And although we had lost, we <clears throat> we spun the title to talk and try and keep that conversation going about the design uh, interpretation and how that's going to affect the design community. So um, so actually there was a bit of a silver lining and our rate of sale increased year after year after year throughout that three year period. Completely. And you've always had a very uh, faithful following with your customer base. Are you still getting loads of lovely letters from your consumers that are buying your products? <laughs> I actually got one today. Uh, yeah, so a little girl had drawn it and designed a trunky for older kids. So that was really nice. But yeah, I mean, I, yeah, obviously investors want to talk about EBITDA. I just want to show them how many pictures I've got of kids yeah. having birthday cakes made in trunkies. I mean, that's, that's the real brand value. Uh, well, that must be wonderful every day, kind of, you know, getting that kind of feedback. So rewarding to have a product that it isn't just a product, but this is the whole lifestyle, isn't it? It engages with people's lives. It's not just, you know, a plastic box. It's, it's you know, it, it's something that people are going on a journey, going to France. I mean, hence why I'm here today, because yeah. I've come back from my holidays in the south of France. I thought, do you know what? I need to interview Rob because I've just had my two kids on trunkies. Mm. But and you do. Well, a, a great tool we've kind of now used. I mean, a lot of businesses talk about their purpose and their vision statements and have them written up on the walls, but they, they just stay in the office. I mean, it should be cemented throughout the brand and your businesses. It should be should just ooze what you are. Uh, and actually, Instagram for us is the perfect platform to, to share that. So our curated Instagram feed is all about kids using our brightly colored products, exploring the world, having fun. So that's, that's a real, real nice focal point for us to really be proud of what we're achieving and to share it. Oh, completely. Um... Rob's just thinking about other things in your journey. Uh, you were kindly awarded with an MBE. Um, how did that come about? And could you tell us about that experience? Uh, well, yeah, that was a, a very bizarre uh, uh, coming to hear about that news because I was actually on my first holiday in five years from starting the business uh, with my partner, Catherine, and we decided to go to Cuba. Um, where there was pretty poor internet connection. And I, I had a message from the government trying to get hold of me and um, I just couldn't find out why. So the mind starts racing. Is it is it tax? And I pay all my tax. Is the bookkeeper a bit dodgy? What's going on? And I finally managed to get this message and it was, uh, they were asking if I wanted to receive an honour from the Queen, which was very nice. But I, I didn't really think I deserved it. I did think it would be a nice day out for the family. Um, uh, and it, uh, yeah, it was just something I never really thought much about um, over the coming years, but but now actually uh, really recognise that it's a very nice uh, accolade to have. And even the experience of, of the award ceremony and, and going to meet the Queen, how did all that unfold? Yeah, so going to meet the Queen, thought it'd be a nice, nice occasion for the family, and Mum bought a new hat, but I thought, well, there's, the Queen's got corgis, you know, I reckon I can make a trunky look like a corgi, and uh, the tiger trunky, typically I convinced him to wear a, a fur coat, and I towed him along to the it was at windsor castle uh and um we were shown around windsor castle and i thought it's probably the wrong idea to take this up and present it to the queen because uh, i might get shot uh so it stayed in the audience and i had, had a nice little conversation with the queen and a bit later on we're walking around the, uh, the castle gardens and um, i spotted the queen's dog walker in the distance with corgis so i ran over with my corgi trunky and we got some great photos uh, that we posted on social media and they did really well. Fantastic. Um, so a wonderful experience all around here. Yeah. <laughs> are you still selling those trunkies or are they? Oh, no, it's just a one-off. Yeah, yeah just yeah. literally double-sided tape fur to a trunkie. <laughs> Sounds like that might be a collector's item down the line. Um, Rob, just looking back on the journey then. So, um, you know, because, I mean, that's amazing. You, you've, you've taken a product from university, really hard to get it into the market to actually commercialise it. You've had massive legal battles. You've been through Dragon's Den. Um, obviously, there's changing markets at the minute, but you're, you're creating new products. What does, you know, 
coming back to that whole thing of success and even looking back on the journey, would you have changed anything so far if you'd had time to repeat your life and go through it again? I, I, I have to get asked what's my greatest mistake, but I can't think you just learn so much from your mistakes that um, if you didn't make them, you'd make different ones. So would I change anything? Probably not. I mean, Dragon's Den couldn't have worked out any better in the end. But at the time, I wish I'd invented a time machine, not rather than a suitcase, but it worked out perfectly. If we hadn't taken the thing to the, the Supreme Court and had a big legal battle, would we have a lot more copies on the market? I don't know. Uh, it, yeah, you, know, you, you just go through life and, and you learn and things work, things don't. You just got to try the best way to navigate your way through. And I think it's overcoming challenges that really help you grow as a person. Um, and also I found that with my team as well. It's been hugely demoralizing for the team to go through some of this stuff with me. Uh, but actually we, we grow and we get through it and, and we build our resilience. And, and actually going through COVID, it has been a huge challenge for us, but we've got a quite a resilient team. Completely. I feel like, and I've um, you know chatted to a number of business owners that are talking about the value and the strength of the team, the resilience, and actually the fact that your good eggs are around you and that they, mm -hmm. they take you through and you, you look back and think, gosh, I have got some phenomenal people around me. And that's obviously the core of your company, isn't it? Um, in terms of the next few years looking ahead, what, what would be an amazing achievement for Trinky? Have you got big plans for where the business is going to go? Uh, well, it's, it's kind of exciting that the, the balance bikes and scooters we did with Halfords are about licensing. Um, so rather than manufacture the products ourselves and try and get them to market and sell them, we got someone on board to do that for us. And it was really just focusing on the, the customer proposition and the innovation around um, what, what become a fairly commoditized product. Uh, so doing more of that, licensing the brand out a bit more laterally is definitely an area that we're pretty excited about. And um, there's still some markets that we need to conquer, China, America. We were doing really well in France and Germany, we still are within uh, luggage. Uh, but yeah, there's still, there's still more to go for. Why are they so hard to crack? Um, America is hard to crack because it, we, we just think it is the same kind of country. It's the same culture, but it's just so not. And it is so different um, and it's so far away. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very culturally different. Um, I mean, we, we have had a huge amount of success in America just being on Amazon, but we did try and set up our own office there and try and supply a whole load of different retailers, but the costs involved were just phenomenal. So pull back. Uh, we must have had a hundred business plans for America that we kept iterating. And certainly at one point I was like, well, we're going to lose money for three years. I'm not going to do that. Uh, and actually e-commerce has really evolved and, and allows you to get into some markets and, and try and invest in some marketing tools to, to build brand awareness. It's interesting you talk about America. I was chatting to one of my friends recently how they had to turn up to their school to present a check um, because even for their school, they're not up to the times where they still need, you know, formal written checks for payment. <laughs> and uh, you're right, it's a, it's, a, it's a million miles back in other ways. I actually licensed Trunky to a, a large toy company uh, back in 2010 to take Trunky to America because I didn't have the time or resource to do it. Um, but they, um, the, the big learning there was, Although they were a big, very big toy company, and culturally there was a good fit with like um, our visions and things, but they were so well known in America, and they just did commoditized products that sold on price, like building blocks and things. Uh, and I said, "Oh, introduce me to your marketing team. We haven't got one. I mean, they're three hundred million dollar turnover business, and they didn't have a marketing department. Well, Trunky needs some marketing. Oh, okay. Well, we'll get get some someone in to to help, and um, yeah." They need a lot more marketing clout. To make so, it like four million trunkies globally today, is that correct? Right? Last time we counted them up, which was yeah, probably almost a year ago, but yeah, yeah, over four million to date. And it strikes me that these trunkies might still be operational. Do, do you know how many actually die out versus how many? Well, we we are really proud of the quality we we can achieve with the products. We offer a five year guarantee, which is roughly the life cycle of a two year old getting a trunky up till se seven. Uh, but then after that, I mean, yeah, lots are sold on eBay, but we always try and champion, keep it as your childhood memory box, keep their old uniforms and postcards and all those kind of keepsakes you used to keep in a shoe box in the trunky. Because actually the child forms such a strong bond with their trunky over that, that time period that uh, it's a great keepsake.
So it keeps getting used. So sales are going to keep growing through e-commerce or through your distribution networks. What else have you got any other challenges or things that you want to achieve in life, you know, even inside or outside of Trunky or with family? Well, it's, it's great just working three days in the business because it gives me time to do other things. So yeah, I mentor a few small businesses, do, do the book, do some speaking work uh, and uh, kind of motivational work. Uh, and it's just now kind of just having a, a go at a few other things and not being completely tied down with this business. So Fantastic. And just for anyone that's never written a book, how hard is it actually to compile a book? Well, a bit like the uh, the Trunky story, uh, I came up with the idea of the book um, that, that was, it's not a business how-to and it's not uh, so much of a famous business person's memoir because I'm not famous. Uh, but the, the publishers, that was the feedback. We either want a business how-to or, and, but you can't do a memoir because you're not famous enough. And I wanted to blend the two and also use storytelling as the main uh, engaging sort of flow through the book. So um, big, big believer in storytelling and um, really wanted it to be more like a page turn, like a piece of fiction rather than a dry, boring business book. Uh, so I, I partnered up with Dr. Peter Hughes, who's a psychologist, entrepreneur, marketer, and he helped ghost write the book with me uh, and, and he took my story and we argued fiercely over certain elements that didn't make the story but it was all about trying to engage the reader to not want to put the book down and rob if you weren't doing what you do with trunky if you could have had any other career where you didn't have to have legal fights and copycats and anything else what would you have done i don't know i think i might have been an architect i'm, I'm really uh I mean, as a kid i was always building dens my dad actually built it, the house that we grew up in um, uh, yeah, really interested in the built environment as well. So uh, maybe I'd have been an architect. Absolutely. And if people want to engage you as a speaker, Rob, if you aren't working in the day-to-day -day job of Trunky, how do they go about engaging with you for speaking events? Yeah, just check out my website, roblaw.com, and you can find all the details there. Uh, and if you want to follow my journey, follow me on uh, Twitter and Instagram, and, and feel free to connect on LinkedIn. My handle on those channels is at Trunky Daddy. Oh, brilliant. What a lovely name. Um, well, Rob, it's been delightful to spend the time with you today. Um, I'm very excited about your journey. Uh, obviously, I've, I've known of you for many years, and I'm delighted to be with you today. I hope to get back again, Rob, hear more about your journey, hear more about your sales. And who knows, the next time I may be coming back from France again, we can sit down and, and share stories. But uh, thank you so much for your time. I look forward to catching up soon. Yeah, pleasure. Thanks for coming. Cheers, Rob. Thank you.